Hello everyone and welcome back to Mog's Workshop. So what was all that about? Well, one of my favourite movies of all time is The Right Stuff. And who is the greatest pilot you ever saw? Well, for me, and for the makers of that movie, it was Chuck Yeager. So what we're going to be doing here is we're going to be making a model of his famous Bell X-1, the first plane to break the sound barrier. But once it's done, we're not just going to plonk it down on a shelf, we're going to make a lovely diorama, something inspired from that very scene in the movie we just took a glimpse at. The desert floor and the bright orange Bell X-1 sitting there ominous, while Chuck Yeager, upon his horse, stares at the future before him. Wonderful stuff, but we're going to start with some rather mundane stuff. We need to paint the interior of these parts here because once they're sealed together you'll still be able to peek inside and see them. We don't want any nasty white plastic looking back at us through the windows. And the same applies to the engine. We've put some black around to mask the plastic so when the engine is in place it'll look just the ticket. Here we go, some silver just going on in nice thin layers and then what we're going to do is we're going to grime it up perfect thing for that is some deep black paint inside the nozzles and then on the outside some null oil. This is a paint made by Citadel. It's normally used on Warhammer miniatures but of course it's lovely in all sorts of other settings and with a little bit of Stormhouse Silver, also a Warhammer paint, we can bring out some highlights. So there we go, we've got the perfect combination of grimy oil and lovely shiny bits. Ooh, doesn't that look metallic? Lights, you say? Yes, lights. Let's use some tiny little lights. Look at these little fellows here. Very good for special effects and inside cockpits. Must label them though because we'll soon lose track when they're not plugged in as to what's what. Also, what's fun? This drill, that's what's fun. We need to make some holes inside some of these components here so we can install our tiny little nano LEDs. They're very, very small and they need very, very small holes. So we need a very, very small drill. Here we go, blasting away. Before long, you've knocked a little hole inside the fellow and you can poke the light inside. Doesn't that look effective? Now, yeah, this kit comes with all kinds of parts, not too many and not too scary, but we do need to base coat them, then we need to mask them. I always prefer to use masking tape wherever possible rather than masking liquid, because masking liquid tends to stink. Also, it's very gloopy and goopy, and I find that when using sprays, it can get underneath and ruin the whole effect. Whereas masking tape, oh, it sticks well. Look at that. No problem at all. Perfect. Oh, a close-up. I do like these. Nice and slow. What a reveal. Oh, that's ace. This olive drab paint is quite pleasant to the eye and will provide a nice base for all of the exciting things we're going to do to it in a moment. Ah, very smooth. Talking of exciting things, here's the control panel. Look at that. It's a nice piece of moulding, but we're going to add some more detail by just lightly brushing some white over these dials. It's a little bit messy at the moment, but we're going to clear it up. First of all, we're going to add some other colours to this too. Some red around some of the dials and then there's all the different lights and switches that we can pick out. That's coming together. Oh, even more so. Look at all of those little knobs and buttons. Wonderful stuff. It really is terribly tiny though, so as we add all the different extra colours to really bring it alive, if we go over the edge, no problems. We'll just knock it back with a bit of black. No one need ever know. It'll be our little secret. I promise not to tell if you won't. Carrying on, we will add all kinds of oils and silvers to this part here. Pick out all the little details, otherwise they'll shrink into the background and we'll never see them. But now, look at that, all kinds of little pipes have come out to say hello. And with a little bit of art coat, we can provide a sheen to each of these little dials. This will mean that when the light catches them, they'll actually look like they're made of glass. It really does work, and just takes a few seconds. Please send me your little control panels too. Always like to see a good control panel. And whatever this thing is. Hmm, needs a little bit more this thing I think. We're going to add some little paint chips. Really bring it to life. There you go. Oh, that's much better. Nice. And while we're at it, we'll add a little bit of distressing to the control panel as well. Because this and the other thing really did get kicked about in the old Bell X1. Splendid. So taking that philosophy forward, we're going to apply it to all of these other little doors and brackets and braces and all the other kind of parts that are inside this fantastic little kit. And for that, grime and weathering is our friend. It really brings 
added detail to where perhaps there might not be such detail in the moulding itself. Weathering and general grime are our best friend here. A good example of that is this seat module. The mouldings are really quite flat, but with a silver-edged paintbrush you can really start to pick out parts, make it look like some engineers have been trampling all over the thing, scratching and scraping away while fixing it up, ready for its next flight. These old bits of military hardware never stay too shiny for too long. Oh, those straps need a little bit of detail though. Let's set to work on those right now. Contrast is our ally here, and we'll hit these with lighter tones. First of all, a very thin coat, and then another brighter one. And before long, they really start to sit proud of the surface. What we need to add here, of course, is the silver details, and they are ever, ever so tiny. But don't forget, if you make a mistake, you can always clear up afterwards with a bit of base coat. Yeah. That looks quite jolly. Now, of course, the Bell X-1 didn't actually take off from the ground. It was dropped like a bomb from another enormous plane. But it did land back on the ground, rather serenely, in fact. A kind of glide back to the desert floor. Well, most of the time, anyway. So here we are, adding some silver to these spokes here to pick them out, and then some lovely null oil into all of these gaps, adding some depth and some goo, so that everyone can see that these are well-used wheels. When it dries out, it'll look really rather super. Yeah, back to the electronics and twisty-twisty on these wires here, because we've got multiple lights and therefore multiple wires, but we want just a single pair of leads to connect to the battery. Otherwise, there'll be a whole mess of wires, and that'll be a pickle to deal with. Covering them up here in nice cosy jackets to stop them shorting out, and it'll keep everything neat and tidy. And then we just test fit our lights, waggling it in the little hole there and then securing it in place temporarily with some tape so we can go in and super glue the wires in place firmly and then blob great big blobs of blobby paint to stop the light leaking out and ruining the effect. It takes a little bit of back and forth, but it's quite good fun. Slowly but surely, the light will disappear. Except for where you want it, and where we want it is, well, right there. Let's have a look at this. Now it came together really quite well. The control panel is suspended on the wires there, but we'll soon be securing it inside the fuselage. Taking an even closer look, we can see that those details have translated rather well. So let's bug it inside the plane shell, shall we? And there it is, looking rather happy. Hello, what's this? Well, it's the strange little handle that Chuck Yeager in real life couldn't operate with his broken arm, so we can't possibly miss that out. Now, what's this? Well, we're going to make some wires come out of the control panel to really make it look a little bit more realistic. Just some simple pieces of wire twisted and bent and glued to the back of the panel. Finally, the rudder pedals and we're good to go. So as I add a thin bead of glue to the shell, you'll notice a weird white lump behind the cockpit. That's a weight. Hmm, I'll more about that later. First thing though, let's get the plane joined together and hold it in place with some nice little tape. Then we'll need to mask every little opening in the plane, otherwise when we spray paint it, we'll destroy all of our previous hard work. Ooh, that'll be boring. Best to avoid that if we can. Now, none of these kits ever goes together completely perfectly, so we must be prepared to do some filling, especially on the seams that are incredibly obvious to the eye, such as right here, right on top. Fill it and sand it. It won't take long, and then you'll have a nice, smooth finish to paint. The same will, of course, apply to the wings, but only once we've got them attached. So again, a nice thin bead of glue. Don't add too much, otherwise you'll only have to scrape it off again. And the wing sits quite happily in place. Same on the other side, making sure to support the first wing with something to stop it flapping around before it's completely set. These parts go together really quite solidly. And now we'll need Chuck Yeager and his horse. And how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to combine several kits. And this old head I had left over from another little kit that I'd put together some time ago. So opening this up, we're chipping away at all of the parts and getting them separated from the sprues. There's quite a few bits and pieces here, but we don't need all of them. We just need the horse and we just need mm, some trousers. And a jacket and some arms, and then we should be able to attach our previous head and have a rather convincing look. Looking Chuck Yeager. Let's see what happens. The models are of the same scale, so if we just saw this poor fellow in half, we should be able to give him a rather nice new jacket, just like the one that was being worn in the movie. At least that's the plan. Let's see how it works out here. The saw cuts through his body like it's made of butter, well it does in fast forward anyway, and yes, that looks like it might fit. 
Let's smooth down his legs so we can wear his new jacket. Don't want anything in the way of making the two models bond together with a little bit of glue. So, hey presto, and a perfect fit. Let's get these stuck together. Again, a nice blob of glue, and we'll put these two bits together, and they shall be forever bonded. Ah, solid as a rock. Wonderful stuff, but he needs some arms, so let's jump back into the kit and find a couple of good ones. Here we go, these should be, hmm, very easy to fit, and here we are. The Headless Rider awaits. And of course, what he awaits is his mighty steed, so gluing that model together and filling in all the little cracks that tend to pop up on these things, we've got a sort of a base of a sort of a horse. Need to file that down and get it nice and smooth, making sure that everything's going to fit together. This way, horsey. Okay, sticking the head into place, and all of those nice seams are going to be hidden by the mane, so that's rather jolly. There's the head, there's the rider, not far away now. Let's get a base coat on this guy. Nice sandy colour on the top, darker on the little feet there, and on the head. The idea here is we're going to blend those two colours together. As at the beginning, they look like, well, they look like they're not blended at all. But don't worry, that's just the start. We'll add a shade and that'll sink into all the nooks and crannies and bring out some of the detail without us having to do really much at all. Still looks a mess though, let's see if we can do better. Right. He is all dried and, ah, that's actually not looking too bad. Still no blend though, and his face looks like he's made of chocolate. Right, let's attack it with some lighter colours. Dry brushing here, from the top down, and then with darker colours from the bottom up. Let's see if we can get these to match in the middle and make something that looks a little bit more of a blended naturalistic look. Ooh, I say, I think we're almost there. That's much better. Of course, he doesn't look alive at the moment because his eyes are very dead. So let's put some gloss on them and let's make him look like he's just blinked and woken up in the morning, ready for a nice trot around the desert. There you go, much better. Okay, no avoiding it, we must do the fiddly stuff. Here we have a very thin brush and we're doing all the leather straps around his head. A little bit of patience though and it really does look nice. Just need to do the silver bits and there they are. They were super tiny, but super worth it. Now, time to fill in the saddle and all of the other accoutrements, and we're almost there to put the rider in place. Taking a little time to pick out some highlights on the mane, and he's all ready for his rider. So, what state's he in? Well, he's still got no head, so that's no good, but he also doesn't have any trousers, so we need to paint those in very quickly, and then his hands there again super quickly. Gosh, I really wish I could paint this fast. Ah. There you are. What do you need next? Hmm. Why did we attack those boots? Let's get some nice brown leather on those boots there and make them all shiny while we're at it too. Adding lighter straps to match those of the horse and then we need one more thing. Of course, the stirrups. They're looking rather good too. One more leather item on this fellow and that's his jacket. We're going to use several layers of this brown paint here to make it really deep. And then we're going to make it look shiny and then we're going to add some highlights. Oh dear, still needs his head though. Aha, bongo, there it comes. And you can see the jacket's got its highlights too and it's looking really rather splendid. There's Chuck Yeager. He just needs his horse. Where's he gone? Ooh, what's this? Well, first we need to add some straps to the horse. More straps? Yes, many more straps. Using the heat gun, we're going to bend these little bits of painted plastic into leather straps to add to the horse. An extra piece of detail which I think really adds to the model. Of course, once you've added one of these, you're kind of committed to adding all of the others. So now the stirrups need little bits of leather too. Holding them with the tweezers and blasting them with a heat gun fuses the leather straps together and we just need a couple of those to be applied to the boots of our rider and all of a sudden we're starting to look as if we've almost got a completed chap. Those extra bits of leather sticking out there will look like they're attached to the saddle when he's in place on the seat. There we go, can't see the join. Now's time for the most fiddly part. We need some very, very thin strips of plastic here because we're going to make the reins. Gluing in place the silver buckles that hold the reins to the horse is a fiddly, fiddly job, as is holding the plastic itself in order to heat treat it to bend it into the perfect shape. This requires a lot of back and forthing, making sure that you've got them looking like they're in his hands. Look at that, waving in the wind. 
So now's time we can put our lovely horse and rider to one side and get back to our plane. And there she is, looking rather perfect and pristine and white. Splendid, almost done. Ooh, hang on a minute. What am I doing here? I'm completely destroying it with lots of black lines. What's all of this mess? Well, I'll let you know. This is called pre-shading. And I want these lines to be as indistinct and wobbly and wibbly as possible. Because ultimately, they're going to be hidden underneath our top coat. But not completely hidden. No, the top coat is quite transparent. And therefore, faint shadows of what we're painting here will peek through. This will give the illusion that we can see the panel lines and the whole construction of the plane through the paintwork. Of course, when you first apply these lines, you feel like you've made a complete buggins of the whole model and need to throw it in the bin. But don't worry, keep applying the top coat in very, very thin layers and you'll see magically those lines start to blend and disappear. You can do these lines incredibly precisely if you wish, or you can do them like I've done, quite blurry. The choice is yours and the effect it produces is rather different. It really depends what kind of model you're making and under what kind of lighting conditions it's going to sit. So one more last coat of paint, just to be sure, and she's ready. She's ready for this, a nice high gloss finish. This will make sure that the reflectivity of the paintwork really sings out, and therefore our blurry panel lines will be perfectly suited to the bright sheen that comes back from the lights. The overall effect should hopefully be that they look like nice deep shadows that will otherwise be terribly difficult to paint once the top coat was already in place. This way is much faster. Yeah, if you ever want a good way to transform a model, put on a transfer. And here we're doing just that. We are slapping on some water and then sliding the little fellow gently in place. Now these transfers would like to be dead square on the side of the wing. So this takes a little bit of moving around, a little bit of drying, a little bit of extra water once it's dried out because it wasn't quite in the right place. And then it's in the right place. Decal soft applied liberally to the top of the decal will do a magic little trick. Let's have a look at what it does in close up. See, it's kind of melted the transfer, it makes it look like it's painted on. Wonderful. There are a number of fun transfers in this kit and it really is a joy to put them on because when you're at this stage you think, my word, I'm nearly done. And it brings the whole thing alive. I'm certainly glad they've included the famous name of this famous plane because painting this in by hand would have been all kinds of horrifyingly difficult. But as it is, it looks great. So let's set everything in place with a lovely layer of our lovely gloss finish, just to make sure that everything is fully seated and won't get scratched off by accident when handling the model. Now one of my favourite paints of all time is this panel line accent colour by Tamiya. This is really, truly, magically wonderful stuff. Look how, when you apply it to a gloss lacquered model, it just follows the lines of the panels there. You just blob it in and it does the rest. It really is quite wondrous and a really satisfying process. Don't worry about being too neat, because we're going to clear that up right now with a bit of MIG thinner on our Q-tip and wipey wipe down the side. We get rid of all of the little blobs. This is always a terrifying moment. Has the masking tape worked? Yes, it has. Thank goodness for that. That would have been really quite upsetting. It's worked everywhere, in fact, including on these little parts. We have bright orange on one side and musty green on the other. Ooh, what a relief that is. Next comes the landing gear and taking special care of the wires still poking out of our fuselage, we put it all in place. It's very lightweight, but holds the model surprisingly steady. At least it will in a minute. Let's do a quick check of our paintwork and make sure we haven't accidentally ruined part of it without noticing. But all is well and we've even added some paint chips around the windows and doors and panels and made sure that our wires are nicely colour coded and that everything is neat and tidy prior to us adding it to the diorama. But one thing remains before we can do that, it's the last thing, it's the oil brush, a very thin mix of black oil paint and a integrated brush and we're going to blob it all around where the rocket nozzles are and then we're going to smear it into place to make it look like some backdraft from these really very powerful rockets has caused all kinds of scorching to the paint at the back of our plane. It takes absolutely ages to set so you've got plenty of working time. Just keep adding layers until you get the result you want. Now, if you recall that weight we put inside the plane earlier, well, I was hoping that would be enough to make the plane stand straight, but no, I needed to cut a coin in half and then slot it inside the cockpit, and then it was nice and stable. Lovely. 
Time to connect our nifty electronics to our nifty electronics box. What's this box going to do? Well, not a lot. It's just got a switch and a battery, and it's going to enable our lights to go on off when you flip the switch. That seems to make sense, doesn't it? Hmm. Just a couple of wires to connect to our wiring loom and a 3D printed box, and yes, we're putting it all together. It's a very simple construction, some push fit and some glue, and does it work? Yes, it does work. Wonderful joy. So let's attach the hat. What kind of hat are we going to have? Well, it's a simple plastic lid, but we're going to attach a nice little label from my typewriter. What fun. Time to bring this bird in for our landing, and well, not on that miserable piece of wood, we need to make our diorama base. So, chopping up all kinds of MDF here, and making all kinds of interesting shapes, and gluing it together in all kinds of interesting ways, and we should be able to emulate something that kind of approximates what we saw in the movie there. A nice base underneath to keep our wires out of the way, and a little chunk chopped out to keep our box snugly secured. Yeah, there's no point going too ape, making sure it's absolutely mega smooth, because what we're going to do now is break out some horrid smelling goo. And we're going to smear it all over the place in order to make our rocky terrain. Then we're going to smooth it, and we're going to leave it out in the sun, before blasting it with all kinds of spray paint to give ourselves a nice deserty finish. But what would a desert be without sand? And here is a whole bunch of sand, different shapes, different sizes, different weights, and different consistencies. It'll all be wonderful when we apply it with this glue, because gravity shall take effect. We'll apply it to the top and look at it slide down there, bringing all the heavy stuff with it. Perfect. I suppose we could have done this manually, placing all the heavy bits at the bottom ourselves, but where would the fun have been in that? Whereas this is a disgraceful mess, and as a result, we've used gravity to our Advantage and had a tremendous amount of fun into the bargain. Time to place Chuck Yeager on his horse into the right spot, just marking it there with a little simple sharpie, a couple of blobs of gooey super glue, and he will be nice and firm. He's not going anywhere. Which is just as well, because we're going to pepper the landscape around him with all kinds of scrubby bushes that we're going to stick to the sand. There are myriads of these available. I like the little self-adhesive ones, they're rather fun. But there are also these ones here that are actually made of a lichen that has been cured in some kind of peculiar way and made into these rather effective looking bushes. They're rubbery and when you squeeze them into the ground they kind of take a few seconds and then ooh, they kind of burst open as if they're alive and they take up all the space they can and look rather natural I think. There's no rule as to how many of these things you can place and where you should place them so just enjoy yourself. You can always peel them off if you think you've made a buggins of it but I think this looks mm, like a desert which is handy. So time to assemble all of these parts into one glorious hole and first of all this box needs to go into this hole battery compartment is secured just with some super glue and a good firm squeeze. But my word, I noticed something, that LED is super bright, so I made a little cap for it. And now when you flip the switch, oh, that's much more pleasing. No longer does it erode my eyeballs. So what's going on underneath the diorama? Well, these 3D printed clips are going to do a jolly job of holding our wires in place. There'll be a little hole cut out for the wire from the plane, and there it is. Very small and very easy to conceal. As you can see, the colour-coded wires are there just in case we need to do any maintenance in the future, and these are easily detached from the black box. Perfect. On the other side, the wires, which are super tiny, just peek through. And we can't avoid it any longer. We're going to have to mask off and paint the canopy. Ooh, there's many bits of little tiny bits of masking bits here. Let's hope we don't go utterly mad. Because then we can complete our ludicrously cinematic plane.
Well, I hope you enjoyed watching that as much as I enjoyed making it. If so, please feel free to comment and like and subscribe for more videos from Mog's Workshop.